they have, we all have to get a hold of. The area of finances, the area of getting ourselves set for what you're going to do next. Lord, I'm going to praise you in advance because the enemy is going to die off of somebody's finances. And Father, they're not going to live by, their, by their, just their wants. But Father, we're going to move into where you want us to be. That your desire will be what we want in this world. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn with me very quickly today to the gospel according to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 in just a moment. Luke chapter 21 in verse 1, and we're going to read a couple of scriptures here, just four quick verses, and then I'm going to get busy. Over the next few weeks, like I said, we're in six, uh, probably five or six sessions maybe, I don't know. We'll see how, how much we get done. I'm going to begin a conversation today that deals with the area of money and finances. And I'm going to be real with you. I'm not going to play with you, but I'm going to, you're, you're going to get something that I pray will be a blessing to you. I'm not here to fix you today. How many of you know debt is something you have to crawl out of? Amen. And that's true money-wise, that's true relationally-wise. If you've ever been through divorce, it takes a while to separate from the debt of the, in the emotional, spiritual uh, input of a relationship. Uh, if you've gone through a divorce, money has to be split, of course. All of those kinds of things. If you've had cancer, you've had hospital debt, all of that kind of stuff. What I'm going to hit today is, and we're going to just kind of go up and down through this. I said this a while ago before we got on the air. When you see these signs anywhere in the world, if you had a $100 bill in your pocket, you're just like thrilled to death. But if you see a $100 bill in a church or a dollar sign in a, in a church, anywhere else in the world, it doesn't matter. But you see that in a church, everybody tightens up, people get ticked off, people start thinking about stuff, all they want is my money. What I'm going to do today is probably, I feel like, one of the best, I'm going to be one of the best preacher friends you've ever had. Because I am going to talk about tithing to a church in the weeks ahead. It will be a part of this. Because the truth of the matter, ladies and gentlemen, is that God gets first place in your life or he has no place in your life. And a lot of us here, I preach this today because a lot of us sing and shout and we want demons to flee and chains to break, but we go home and our bank accounts are a mess. Well, demons flee when your whole life is right. And so I want to get you balanced. And some of you, I love you, you love Jesus more than I do, but you're not balanced in your life. And I want to help you. And over these next sessions, we're going to see some cool things start. But today we're going to start with those who are at the bottom of the barrel, those who feel like they can't give a dime to anything. I got your back, girl. I got your back, brother, this morning, okay? We're going to start at the bottom of the barrel, and we're going to get moving. So Luke chapter 21 and verse 1, there's two types of people in this passage. I'll go ahead and give you the hint. Luke chapter 21 verse 1 says this, And he looked up, Jesus, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, you know, into the offering plate. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these, I can see him pointing at all these rich people, all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. I'll explain that in a minute. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Wow. In this passage, you got people with abundance giving, and you got a woman who's got two mites left to her, and she gives those. That's good stuff. Somebody say this out loud. Hey. hey. Say la. Say hey. hey. Mind your business. Mind your business. That's what I'm going to talk about for the next sessions. Not just today. I almost called this Mo Money, Mo Problems. 
but there's a bunch of people in here who would be offended at the reference point. So I'm going to go ahead and call this today what the entire series of messages is going to be called. Mind your business. Destroying generational poverty and building kingdom prosperity. Because it's not about you. It's about him. If you are a Christian. So we're going to talk about it today. Long before, if you remember these lyrics, a penny for your thoughts, a nickel for your kiss, and a dime if you tell me you love me. In this economy, that wouldn't go very far, would it? <laughs> as worthless as a penny seems to be today, it actually far exceeds the value of when coins were first started being minted in this nation. In fact, the first coins, I don't know if you know this, in this country will call the Fujio coins. Some people call them Fujio. Fujio coins. This is one on the screen right here behind me. The Fujio coins were founded by Benjamin Franklin, and on the back of the coin, it had a picture of the ray of the sun hitting a sundial. By the, word, the, by the way, the word Fujio actually means, listen to this, you'll like this, time passes by. It's ironic that Benjamin Franklin, who minted these first coins in American history, would name this coin that time flies while you're having fun. You've heard the phrase, time is money, haven't you? Meaning that those who waste time actually waste money. And if you notice, I don't know if you can squint and see it, but on the very bottom of the Fujio coin, the very first coins minted in American history, the original Coins had these three words at the bottom, mind your business. Think about that today, ladies and gentlemen. Think about that. Think about that. Think about what, Brady? <laughs> Think about the fact that the first coins in America had the slogan, mind your business. Mind your business. It wasn't throwing shade like today's slogans are when somebody gets in your business and you say, mind your own business. That's not what this means. This slogan wasn't throwing shade. The historians that I read say that it referred to the creator, Benjamin Franklin, actually being a successful businessman himself. So his point was for everybody that would gain this coin, watch this, would pay attention to the business that God has given them charge over. That they would pay attention to where these coins are going. Or today we would say, I got my mind on my money. There's some, there's some redneck thuglets up in here today. I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. The Fujio coin actually stayed in circulation until 1956 when Dwight D. Eisenhower, when he became president, passed a law to take, I don't know if you know this, to take off of the coin, mind your business, and put it at the bottom of that coin, replace it with, does anybody know? In God we trust. Is that not amazing that from 1776 until 1956, the mantra for this nation would be, mind your business. And then in 1956, another level was placed on it when we shifted from mind your business to in God we trust. It took a long time to shift uh, our focus from business to trusting God. What's the point, Brady? Hang with me. Friends, today... If you are going to excel in this kind of an economic climate, you have to learn as a Christ follower to put those two phrases together. That I trust God to mind my business. I am giving God all authority over all the business affairs of my life. I am giving God complete 
authority over my affairs and my business, whatever that business could be, because I'm a, I'm a prophetic preacher in that I believe there's an entrepreneur down inside of you. I believe there is wealth that has been placed, and you'll hear more about this next week. If you've got a business idea that's been stirring in you for years, you've got to be here next Sunday, because I'm going to talk to you from a biblical perspective how God has called some of you to make a living in this world, watch this, not just so you can store it up and buy boats, but so you can make a, an impact in this world for good and for God. But it's putting your affairs all in the lap of God, all in the trust of God, where you begin to say, God, you gave me the idea. You gave me the concept. Now I'm giving it back to you. Lord, this business is not going to fail. Just listen to what you hear. My business is not going to fail. Mind your own business. My business will never fail. My bank account will not go negative anymore. Poverty will not be in my family tree anymore. My daddy may have been a waster. My mama may have been a waster. My grandmother may have been a waster. My, my ex may have been a waster. But this business call that you've entrusted me, which is the money in my account, this business is not going to fail. And poverty is not going to be in my family tree. It's not going to pass to my kids because, Lord, I believe the, that the resurrection of money is go, and poverty being destroyed is go, and prosperity being born is getting ready to happen in my finances. I don't care what this world is doing. I don't care about pandemics. I don't care about lost jobs. I trust the God of the universe to come through for me. And these next three quarters of this year are going to exceed anything and everything else that has happened in my... God, I give you the authority over my financial life, over my personal life. And, the, and I even give you authority over the business I've not even birthed yet. So God... Get all up in my business so I don't waste my potential on my way to heaven. I want to tell you something this morning, and I want to be very honest with you. You have been hoodwinked by your culture. The average, listen, you, we have been hacked by this culture. People in power have taken advantage of glitches in our personalities, and I'm saying in our personalities, low, middle and lower middle class people, and the, the rich have taken advantage, advertisers have taken advantage of personality glitches and our need to fit in and stand out so that we'll have no problem putting a $100 tennis shoes on a credit card that's already maxed. You still love me? They're actually profiting off of the sale of the shoe and the other shoe and making the, and you having to make interest payments that are going to go out. So you may take a hundred dollar pair of shoes and you say, well, I'll pay it off in six months. You've added another $150 to a stupid $100 pair of shoes that your kid is going to be muddied up and won't even have. And, and I'm telling you, advertisers have hoodwinked you. Politicians have hoodwinked you. They count on you to have short attention spans. Banks know that you're impulsive. Do you know when gyms make all of their money? Gyms, fitness gyms? January. Because they know you're going to pay up and never show up. <laughs> Powerful organizations need a truth teller. And I'm going to tell the truth today. I may not have a big platform, but I'm going to tell the truth because I don't want you to waste your life trying to keep up with the Joneses and then they refinance. It's time for us to hack back. Powerful organizations need a truth teller. Let me tell you something. Church needs a truth teller. I don't preach for money. I don't preach for money. I don't have to. I've got, I own three businesses myself that I operate. I'm telling you, I'm going to learn some stuff for myself today. I am afraid Christian people, many of us have allowed blessings to make us victims instead of us applying sound biblical principles to help us be victors and make an impact in this world. We don't, we spin just like the world. We do. We, we spend like the world does. We want to look like the world does. Even our worship music sounds like 
worldly music five or six months after a, a, a popular song comes out. We can't do anything original. And yet, wealth is something in America that's tough to talk about because some of you have been in third world nations as I have been. And I've been in some third world nations where to be wealthy is to have your own bucket to go down to the muddy river and pick up muddy water and bring it back home for your family. That's wealth. So regardless of where you are, can we just already put our guard down and say, forgive me for saying this, by God, we're all wealthy. If you woke up this morning in a bed... You're better than half the people in this world. If you put something in your mouth to go to your gut this morning, you called it breakfast, you ate better than half of the world's population. So don't tell me you're broke, you ain't got nothing. No, you just don't have the money to buy the Mercedes you want. You're all rich. Orchard guys, look at me. You're rich. You had a place to sleep last night. Remember where you did sleep that time. Lady, you're rich. You may not have a husband who's bringing home the money, but you got clothes on your back and peace in your mind. Come on, help me now. So don't tell me you're just preaching to make about rich. We're all rich. We're all rich. I was, I was reading the other day about a, a, a new, I was reading a, a new story about debt in America and the church's response to it, particularly in minority communities and middle and lower class people. The reality is what's, what's happening in the church is that lots of people shout, sing, and come to church and they are so deeply in debt, they actually are shouting over their issues. We have to start dealing with this in the church because I don't want to waste my life, do you? I don't want to waste my life. And I told the Lord recently in my life, I said, God, I want to make so much money. I want to have so much money come through these hands that, 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 that I could just imagine dreaming what I could do to make an impact for people in this world. And none of it stick to these palms. But most of us live by a poverty mentality in this church. Do you know what the oppressed poverty mentality is? It's the first and the 15th. If you live your life by the 1st and the 15th, you are in a, what America calls an oppressed mindset, a poverty mindset. An oppressed mindset does not process like normal people. The, an oppressed mindset, their life is modulated by due dates. When the check comes in on the 1st, when the check comes in, and when the bills are due on the 15th, when the bills are due on the 1st, it is a survival technique. And my goal in this series is not, is not that you live your life and money owning you. Has money ever made you anxious? Has money ever made you anxiety filled because the money wasn't in the bank yet? I want that to die out of your life. My goal in this series in the next few weeks, for God's sake, be in church. I'm not going to placate you. Get in here, man. I drove 170 miles to be here today. Get in this church with your wife, your family, your boyfriend, whoever you're fixing to marry, and let's get some stuff set up so that your life won't be locked the rest of your life into the 1st and the 15th. The lower middle class is actually the, uh, is actually the best at taking care of each other. If you grew up in the hood, some of y'all grew up in the hood, there was a time when there might be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon bullets flying across neighborhoods. I got a friend of mine who grew up in the ghetto, and he said, Brady, I'm telling you, guns would be blaring, but we never locked our doors at night because somebody might need some air conditioning. The lower middle class are the ones. We've, listen, listen. Lower middle class folks, we feed the hungry. Yeah, we do. Statistically, we give more money to philanthropic organizations than the rich people do. It's time to break the poverty mentality off of our lives. But I'm going to tell you this one. It's time to stop driving Escalades up to single wides. Come on now. Oh, I wish I had this. I took screenshots of this yesterday. I was flying from California home yesterday on Southwest Airlines. I, I tried to get those, the pictures um, to, to upload. They wouldn't do it. I was flying home yesterday, and I, was, I looked down, and you know when they hand you a drink, they give you a little napkin. And the napkin said this on one side. It said about Southwest Airlines. In 1971, a triangle, which was between Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, a triangle, 
1971, a triangle scribbled between three cities on a napkin transformed a dream into an airline and a wanna into a gonna. I was like, whoo, I got to preach that. <laughs> wanna into gonna. The back of the napkin said this, where will your wanna take you? Mm, that's good. Because a lot of us want to do stuff. And church, I love you, but y'all so much better at talking than you are doing. You love to tell me what we ought to do. You love to tell him what she ought to do. We love to tell people in the church, we need this and we need this and somebody needs to do this. Guess what? You're the one. You're the one. We need a worship leader. If you can't sing, don't come up here. You will shut this church service down. But a lot of us treat God like the one-armed bandit. Do y'all know what a one-armed bandit is? There ain't no real people in this room, is there? Yeah, yeah, l let me refresh your memory. It's called Tunica. It's called Metropolis. It's called Vegas. One-armed bandit. What's a one-armed bandit? A lot of Christians, they think God's a slot machine. You gamblers know what I'm talking about. You put a quarter in the one arm bandit, hoping for the immediate result, don't you? Money on the spot. Hey. You know what Christian people are doing? We're living like the world. We still think the million dollar check is going to come one day. We live in a one arm bandit generation. Your children want today what it took you 30 years to accumulate. Have you ever noticed when you put something in the microwave oven and you zap it real fast how quickly it cools when you take it out? But if you put it in a crock pot, you pull that out 45 minutes later, it's still burning on your plate, isn't it? Why? Because what you cook slow and build slow is what will last and heat you forever. Come on, somebody. So if you have an immediate satisfaction problem, guess what? You got an area of your life that you need to be delivered from today. Because your immediate satisfaction is, I need this. Boom. I, did, I was just going to the grocery store and I came home with a $400 purchase. You didn't need that. And, 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 and I, put, oh, I put it on my credit card and I'm going to pay it back with my tax refund. I hear people say it every Christmas. Oh, we're just so stressed. We had to buy, we had to get, oh, we just went through Christmas. We just went through Christmas and we're going to get our tax refund in July. I'm like, do you realize how much, you put it on a credit card at 25% interest. Do you realize from November when you went shopping for Boo Boo's new PF4, F5, 6, which won't be working in five months anyway, and you put it on there for a thousand, twelve hundred bucks, five thousand dollars, whatever, and you go to July at 25 to 30 percent interest your tax refund if you're lower middle class won't come anywhere near paying that off I tell people all the time don't you realize Christmas comes every year at the same time and if we could get you to plan rather than try to be a one-armed bandit Christian you might see God do something I want to today to break the spirit of poverty off of your house I was going to do this a couple of weeks from now, but might as well do it now because I got it right here. Look at here, y'all. Look at here. You see that? Would you love for me to make it rain up in here right now? Huh? I, look. Huh? Look at that. One, two, look at all that, hey. What would you buy if you had all this? Let me tell you something. You know what we're doing with this right here? Instead of going, okay, let's see if we could turn this into this again. And then when, that, when those two piles come together, then the next pile, the third pile, it may take a few years, but the third pile will be three times the size of the first two together. 
But because we have instant gratification, do you know what we do? Jordans. Oh! Ooh, they got some new Mac makeup now. You know, we hadn't been on a real date in a long time. What? What? Electric bill was $700 in January. When it's normally 500, it don't matter. It's okay. Because, see, they got coats on sale at Marshall's. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. You have been bugging me about that new stupid game forever. I've told you six months now you're not having it. Just to shut Junior up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Woo, hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop. Pull over, pull over. Friday night, we're on date night. Did you see that new shiny 2022 sitting out there with that spotlight on it? You know, we've been needing an SUV anyway. What? Now look what I'm left with. Instead of three piles, it will take nine times the time to make this pile turn into the first pile. Y'all, it's time to break poverty. So that whenever somebody needs a house built in Milan, Tennessee, you know what I can do? I can say, you know what? No problem. And we can pool our money together. And we can see God do amazing things. I have a friend of mine in Memphis, Tennessee, whose church is across from a shopping mall. And he stood up in his church and he said, you know what we're going to do? Instead of y'all taking God's tithe money and money that you're wasting that we could do together to make an impact, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to pray God put all our resources together, and guess what? We're going to buy that shopping mall. And you know what they did? They laughed. They laughed. Because in church in the South, we just, we're just all about fellowship dinners and hugging on each other. And five, four years later, they bought the shopping mall. And they now have... African-American business owners, lower middle class, white middle, uh, um, business owners, all in there making a living. Can you dream with me a second and get out of your bank account? And if you, if you belong to this church, can you imagine what we could do if we could get so freed up financially, individually, that then we could come in here. We keep talking about trying to be a church. You know, here at Vineyard keeps talking about trying to be a church that's out of the box and a regional compassion center. We can't be a regional compassion center if your credit card debt is so messed up that it takes 80% of your salary every week to pay it off. Yeah. And in case you don't like this, you would be interested to know. That was the introduction. Was that okay? You would be interested to know that Jesus taught more about money than he did heaven and hell or worship or demons getting cast out. There's only one thing that God talked about more than money and that was the kingdom of God coming. In fact, I'll throw this in because you look like nice people. 11 of the 39 parables that Jesus told, you know, a parable is a story. 11 out of 39 in the Bible deal with money. One out of every seven verses in the Gospel of Luke that you just read about deals with money. Over 2,000 verses, your king that you gave your life to, hopefully, your Jesus, watch this, your Jesus dealt with the poor. In fact, if you'll look at his 
powerful declaration from the book of Isaiah. Show them Isaiah, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus gives this powerful declaration about his own ministry when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, hearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. You know what Jesus came to do? Set oppressed people free. Set oppressed people free. But debt, look at me. New mamas, look at me. New daddies, look at me. Debt and poverty, trying to love on your kids, will bind you up and kill you. What is the number one cause of divorce in this nation? It is not premarital affairs. It is money issues. We are never supposed to be controlled by the world's economy. I don't want to go down this road yet, but I'll give you a hint of weeks to come. This, is a, this planet Earth is a word planet. It was spoke into existence by a holy God. Everything on Earth is a result of God's word. But the problem is that many of us allow our friends who don't even come to church to speak into our lives, our media to speak into our lives, our culture to speak into our Christian lives, so we end up settling and then struggling all of our our lives. I'm preaching good right there. We come to church and dance and shout and pray, but we can't pay our bills. We can't even get into school. We can't save, we can't get our kids in the school that we want. Some of us have to beg to get, and this is not people who don't have jobs. I have seen people in church come running down the aisles doing backpack giveaways for children, not because they don't have a job, but because they spent it all and they forgot that their kid needs school supplies. Help me preach somebody. We can't be the church. We can't give to any causes. We can't bless everyone. All because we go through life mismanaging managing our business. The goal for this study, honestly, is going to be Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Show them, Isaiah. It says this, and I want you to get here, man. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Can you imagine a running over into your life? I'm a testimony of it. Aren't some of you? A running over will be put in your bosom and with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. What am I telling you? It is time to break poverty off of your family tree. It is time to stop begging for what you need after you've blown money on what you want. Preach, oh, oh, preach, Brady. I'm about to preach. Let me get you to do something. Let me get you to do, y'all about to lose you, I'm about to lose you. Everybody put your hands out like this. This. Put your palms up. You don't have to hold them up. Just put them out in front of you. Look at those palms. Think about all the money that ran through your hands that has been wasted and wonder how much better off you could have been. We could have been. I'm with you too. Financially, if we had that wasted money back in our hands. Thank you. That the only way to break this cycle is to get sick and tired of being sick and tired and recognizing that um, immediate gratification is a demon. It is a spirit. It is a demon. And it will kill you. We come to church and run and shout and praise God and we go home and we don't have anything. Well, guess what? If you don't have anything, you can't help anything. If you don't have anything, you, you know who gets ticked off the most when I find preachers asking for money in a church? People who have wasted their substance with riotous living in the hog pens of this world. You got the gall to go blow your money at a strip club, at a, at a, at a, at a, at a pawn shop, at an auction bar, wherever you are, some auction barn, some, 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 some place you think, some goodwill that you said was cheap, all that stuff. And yet you know that God has has a plan on your life. And the reason you're conflicted even right now is because you realize you have spent and sown into things that have no return. God's, God is not blessing us just for us. I believe that in order for us to live out our kingdom assignment, we're going to have to learn outside of church as well as in church to become good stewards of what God gave us so we can then become a blessing to the world. I'll never forget, I'll throw this at you, I'll never forget years, a couple of years ago, a young girl sent me a message. I get messages on Facebook like you do all the time, and this young girl wanted to go to uh, a foreign nation to be a missionary. 
I knew this young girl, had known her for years. I knew her little car. I knew her little, I knew her little car she bought. I knew, I knew she was, she had, she had left college because she said she was going to do something else. She was all there and she wanted some money to go on a, on a, on a, um, on a, uh, a mission trip to a foreign nation. And she needed, I think it was $5,000. She set up a GoFundMe and she had at that point when she got a hold of me because I checked on it, five of $5,000. And I went back to her because I'm crazy. I said, let me ask you something. Where's that little car of yours? Oh, I traded up. You traded up? Yes, and the payments were only $340 more a month. Well, are you not still in college trying to become a nurse? She wanted to be a nurse. She wanted to be an RN. She said, no, I didn't do that. I did. That, wasn't, that wasn't where the Lord was leading me. So you went and blew your parents' money for three semesters before you figured out this was where you weren't supposed to be. But you want to go be a missionary for two weeks? You know what I told her? Y'all ain't going to like me. Don't ask me to fill in holes. You want me. That's what the church does. Send me money so I can go to the ramp school of ministry. School. I want to go to Bethel. I want to go to Africa. I want to do all this. Well, how much have you invested in it? Well, I put $250 in by faith. I'm just believing the Lord. You got years to plan ahead before you move anywhere. I want you to know that God, can I give you one liner for this whole day? God, I want you to know, God will bless you the day he can trust you. Oh, I just said something right there. There's some marriages squirming in this room right now. But God will bless you the day he can trust you. In 1986, the former chairman of Chrysler Motors you know him, Lee Iacocca, many of you know that name. He was the leader of a project to restore the Statue of Liberty. He received generous donations from wealthy people all over the world. The Bill Gateses, the, the, um, the, the, the Steve Jobses, all the wealthy people, the Warren Buffets. But the gift Lee Iacocca said in his autobiography that impacted him the most, listen to this, you'll love this, came from 78 homeless Vietnamese refugees living in a concentration camp in Thailand. The 78 refugees, watch this, sent Lee Iacocca $117.19. They had lost everything except their hope, and they knew about the Statue of Liberty, how much hope it gave. Even years ago, when into that harbor, you could come and see old Lady Liberty with her, uh, you know, with her baton up in the air, with her torch up in the air. And he said, nothing made any more difference to me than those refugees from Vietnam who sent me $117.19. God will bless you the day he can trust you. By the way, all those Vietnamese refugees, out of 78 of them from 1986 until 2012, 34 of them are multimillionaires living in New York City because Lee Iacocca had every one of them brought here. God will bless you the day he can trust you. I believe that God, look at me, this is not just a little three-point sermon and a little church service to make you feel like you pleasing your mama for going to church. Throw that crap out, please. I believe for some of you in this room that God is getting ready to so get in your business that you're going to finally, finally get free from the false obligations of stuff you thought you had to have. God said, he that the Son sets free is free indeed. And I may not shout you, and you may not like this kind of preaching. Well, go somewhere else where they'll tell you a bunch of hoodlum stuff and theology. But I want you to be free. I don't want you to come to church and try to dance and shout and become over-spiritual to make up for the last six and a half days of your bondage to make yourself feel better. The devil is a liar. I want you free. Watch this. But I don't just want you free from your abuse. I don't just want you, although that's enough, I don't just want you free from your crack habits or your drug habits or your alcohol habits. I want you free from mortgages. I want you free from student loans. I want you to finally get free from car notes. I want you to get free from IRS payments. I want you to finally get free from the lien on your house. Somebody preach with me now. I want you to get free from people always having their hand out to you. I want you to get free from false obligations. I want you to get free 
from working where you aren't valued. Even if you have to go to work for yourself. I want you to be free from being under demonic supervisors in your career. I want you to get free, so free that work, that you have work, that that work always causes you migraines and loss of sleep. And I want you to be free and be free to embrace the new. And I want to start a riot. I want to start a revival. I want to start something that I don't hear anybody else in the belt buckle of the Bible well talking about. I want to start the liberty process of setting you free from the dangers and the bondage of what money has done to destroy a Christian witness. When I read about those ragtag Vietnamese refugees, I thought about this widow woman in Luke 21. This woman is unnamed, yet she's placed in the Bible Hall of Faith. She is the hero of all those unnamed and unnoticed saints of God who keep the churches going. She represents, this woman does, she represents those who just because they love Jesus do the work of the Lord unselfishly. She is considered by theologians to be a gold medal giver in the Gospels. She's considered this, watch me y'all, even though she only put two small coins in the offering plate. They were called two mites. Do you know what a mite tallies up to be in Bible times? It tallies up to be a fourth of the day's wages in Bible times. They weren't called pennies. They weren't called dimes. They weren't called nickels. They were called mites. And this woman, the book just said it, didn't it? Gave her last two mites. The widow's mite doesn't represent, listen to me, listen to me, shh, 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 doesn't represent the least we give, but the most we give. Understand, when it comes to giving, God sees more than the portion, God sees the proportion. Men see what is given. I don't have time to tell you, but in Bible times, you know what they did? Offering plates were made out of copper. You know what rich people would do? they they pull a LeBron. they pull a Jordan. they back up and do a little shot so that when it hit the offering plate and they gave all their money, ding, 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 and it would echo all over the sanctuary so that everybody would know, you know, sister here's got it going on. This is the rich guy got it going on. They back up and do a three-point in there. This woman, this widow's mite, just literally shaking hand, put two mites in a portion. How many of y'all know men see what is given, but God sees what's left? Winston Churchill said this, show him Isaiah. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Isn't that good? See, we know that that word might, might, M-I-T-E, it's called in the Bible, but turn it over. There's another word for those of us, remember I told you earlier, I'm going to preach to those of you who don't have two nickels to rub together, those of you that are at the bottom who wish you could have money to give. Notice something, might, M-I-T-E, was the lowest form of a coin, but we have a God who knows how to strengthen us when we are without might, M-I-G-H-T, because we have a God, because we understand might to be energy, power, support. Think about it. This woman comes to church as a widow. She doesn't have much strength left. Her husband has died. Her grown children are nowhere to be found. She is alone, clearly operating on a fixed income. But she presses her way into worship with a strength that she does have left. There are some people sitting around you today. They don't understand how little might you have left. Many of you in this room I've got to meet. You operate with little might all the time because life has beat you up and you're practically driving emotionally, spiritually on empty. And what I have found, those of us who have little might in our lives, we don't have time to argue. We don't have time to explain ourselves. They're tired of defending themselves. They're tired of being misunderstood. People with little might in life are, are tired of assuming the worst, tired of being the bigger person, tired of being taken for granted. I'm preaching and y'all are all just sitting there. People who are low on their strength and have little might in their life are tired of being taken lightly. But in spite of all that, this woman, just like some of you, she found the strength to get in the presence of God. 
When some of you got up today, you didn't feel like coming to church. Neither did I. You didn't feel like it at all. And you had to talk yourself into it and say, well, I guess I'll go up there. I don't know what God's going to do or what's going to happen. And suddenly in this service, maybe at the beginning, maybe now, I don't know. But I'll tell you what God is doing for you. He's not dropping mites as far as money. Show them, Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 40, verse 29, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases the strength. I came to tell somebody, you are stronger than you think. You are not a weakling. The devil is a liar. You are not a pushover. You are not going to live in what you've lived in. You have the power of God in your life. If you've survived all the hell you've been through till now, I got news for the devil. Devil, you should have kept me in bed this morning because I got up. I'm coming to church. I'm getting my might back. I'm getting my strength back. I'm getting my energy back. I've got to get this together. In fact, after all you've been through, if you were a coward, you'd be dead by now. Bad to the bone people can take what's little in might and make it work for what they've got. Whew. Somebody say work it. Work it, work it, work it, work it, work it. You're still standing. So don't tell me God hadn't been good to you. Oh, she had two mites, but she had more might in her. I found a guy, but I couldn't find him in Revelation. I couldn't find him in Matthew. I couldn't find him in John. Y'all, I was looking for this guy, and I couldn't find him. Chris, I was trying to find him. I couldn't find him. I was trying to find this one guy. I found him on a Saturday morning. I found him on a Saturday morning. His name is Popeye. He's got an amazing testimony. I know he's not in your Bible. I don't know if he ever met Jesus. But I'm going to tell you his testimony. Popeye was a sailor man. Don't look at me like that. You, will, you couldn't get up here and do better illustrations. Some of his brothers going, uh, what's this player hater? Just sit there, man. But he was always getting beat up by Bluto. Bluto only wanted to fight Popeye. Do you know why? Because he had oil. If Popeye didn't have oil, he wouldn't be messing with Popeye. You don't even know why the enemy's fighting you, do you? You may tell you why the enemy's all in your bank account and you, can't, you get to the end of a week, end of a month, and suddenly you look back and you go, I had a whole bunch of money. How come the enemy took it all away? Where's it going? I'll tell you why the enemy... If you're wondering today why the enemy is fighting you so bad, it's because you got olive oil. You, if oil wasn't on your life, the enemy wouldn't mess with you. Those of you that just are little church Sunday people every three or four months, I don't have a word for you. But if you're here and you know that somewhere back there, God put a place down inside of you. God put a business inside of you. God put an entrepreneurial spirit down inside of you. He's beating you up because you got some oil on your life. What is amazing to me is that Popeye keeps getting beat up because Bluto wants his olive oil. And our grandmamas and our mamas taught us that we had to eat our spinach in order to be strong like Popeye. But let me tell you what mama and grandmama did wrong. They lied to you. Because while Popeye was getting beat up, he still had the strength to pop a can of, grab a can of Campbell's chicken noodle soup, bro, and in one hand pop the can top off of it. He was not supposed to have any strength until he ate the spinach, but he could still open before he ate it. And the muscles popped out. I'm preaching better than you honkies are amen in me. He could still pop the can open before he ever ate it. And I never figured out how he had the strength to open the can while he was getting beat up. Well, I think I came to the answer on the drive-in this morning. That's because before he ever got beat up, he touched the oil. Come on, help me somebody. Because when you touch the oil of the God I'm talking about, it's better than Wesson. It's better than olive. It's better than anything. When you touch the oil I'm talking about, the oil I'm talking about will run demons out of your living room, baby. 
baby. When you get this oil on you, your bank account will swell up and the demons will tremble. And every now and then you have got to give God glory for the strength that you've got even when you should have been defeated. Is there anybody in this sweet church who had strength? You didn't know where it came from. It was at 2 o'clock in the morning and you had the strength to make it through. I wish you'd give God a little bit of praise in this place. I had strength when I didn't know where it came from. Woo. Somebody say, mind your business. Jesus is in church one day and there were offering plates set out. There was no paper money. And in the temple, the beautiful structure, I told you, I'll go back over it one more time for those of you who may have missed it because it's a real important point. All these embellished, costly decorations and Jesus wasn't even impressed with their temple. He would tell them that their, their temple's going down in one day. Remember that? The offering plates were made out of copper. All the big wigs off, would make their offering. They'd LeBron it in. They'd, they'd arch it, arch all their coins in, and it hit the plate. And it'd make noise all over the place. That's why we Christians today, us Christian people here and all across the world, believe in what we call the sacrifice of praise according to the book of Hebrews because your praise offering ought to make some noise when it hits the plate of God's receiving it. And if you haven't been through anything, you won't praise God for anything. But if you have learned to trust Jesus, now I'm going to preach you. Because if you've learned to trust Jesus when the bank account was low, when you didn't have anybody to trust, and in this moment, everybody's walking down, dropping their coins in, their offerings are making noise, and here comes this widow woman. And these two little mites, little bitty coins, and her offering, watch this, listen with your spirit, her offering didn't make any noise at all. What's the point, Brady? Because sometimes people underestimate you because you don't say a lot. Just because you don't see me making noise, Brady, don't mean I don't love Jesus. Sometimes God deals with me in the quiet places, but he still sees my sacrifice. And due to his omniscience, knowing everything, Jesus knew exactly why she gave. Jesus knew exactly what she gave. Imagine sitting beside somebody you've never seen in church and you ask them, what are you giving today in the offering plate? They tell you, mind your own business, right? Because people are all secretive. But it, it, they'd be offended. People start texting, you know, they hide money in the palm of their hand. They suddenly go to the bathroom because they don't want you to know what they're giving. Can I, tell, can I give you a scripture that I hope will release you? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. Show them Isaiah. Proverbs 15, 3. Look at this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the good and the evil. Yeah, yeah, watch this, watch this. What, what's that have to do with me, Brady? I want to tell someone right now sitting here, his eye is right now watching your bank account. So he's not, Brady. His eyes are in every place. His eyes on my credit score. See, you don't think about that, do you? It's time we get Monday into Sunday, y'all. The reason some of y'all are so schizophrenic and won't walk with God half of your life is because you hadn't put Jesus in your Monday yet. His eye is on my income to debt ratio. His eye is on my bills. And I cancel prophetically for four of you in this room. I cancel every enemy trying to fraudulently break, break into your bank account. Your name is not going to be compromised. Your internet is, your interest is not going to be, is going back up. The internet is not going to steal from you. Equity is going back into your house this year. God has got his eye on you. You know what happened? You know what happened? I got to go quick. I got to go quick. The wealthy people who went ahead of this widow, they had the wrong intention. They were giving in church for recognition. But this poor woman was doing it as an act of worship and devotion because, the true, because true giving is directed toward God. Let me pause right here. In the event that there is a remnant in this room today who knows, I owe God some worship. I got to give him some glory. I owe him because he rescued me from financial ruin. The worshipers, the real worshipers, they do it not to be seen, not to be impressive. They do it because they owe him. I, I remember one time, not long ago, I was in a church office and a woman came into the office 
and asked to see me. And the pastor said, he'll see you at the end of the service. She came up at the end of the service and she asked me to pray for her. And I said, sure, I'll pray for you. She said, I said, yes, I'll be praying for you. She said, no, Brady, I need you to pray for me now. Don't send me to somebody. Because for the last three weeks, me and my three kids have been sleeping in our car. And last night we slept in the parking lot of this very church. She said, I knew that if I could just get to the house of God, I just knew something could be done for me. And you know what's scary to me? Because I'm a preacher and I can't help it. Preachers have to stand down and beg all you bougie people to give God glory. When your children woke up in their own bed today, I have to beg you to praise God and you ate at a table this morning or you're going to one right now and you drove a good car to get here. You have to learn to trust God and learn how to demonstrate that trust. Watch me, hear me, when you are baroque. Because if you don't praise him when you're poor, how many of y'all know there's a difference between being poor and being poor? If you can give God glory when you've only got two mites, I have it in my mind and he starts trusting you and the one pile turns into the second pile and the second pile turns into the third pile. You won't have any problems. To, if you can give God glory with two mites and keep your head on right and not go off and buy yachts everywhere one day and buy stupid hunting equipment that you won't need anyway and keep your head on straight for the future, guess what can happen? Guess what can happen? When a real need comes before you and somebody says, praise God, you're not going to look at how thick your bank account is. You're going to rewind in your mind back to when you had two nickels that you couldn't hardly rub together and you're going to say I'm going to give God praise with tears coming down my face because I remember when I didn't have anything I didn't have two nickels or two mites to rub together and now I realize after all that sacrifice and all that pain and all that trial and all that heartache I give him glory because I know in whom I have believed you got to learn to praise God when you don't have it and then double praise him because you do have it. Woo. But when you've been in quarantine, you can't breathe, you can't focus. This widow, your life is turned upside down. You lost your job. Can I tell you something as bad as the pandemic was? Look at me. More millionaires in America. More people during the pandemic became multimillionaires from February 2020 until right now than in the last 25 years combined in American history. Don't tell me that God can't use you. But God can't bless you till God can trust you. Some of you right now are just like this widow woman. Watch me. You have your back against the wall, but you dragged yourself out to church today to say, Lord, I don't know when I'm going to do it, when you're going to do it, but I know you've got a miracle with my name on it. And God, watch me, watch me. I'm not going to sit back and eat bonbons and wait on you to come. I'm going to put business thoughts on the paper. I'll show you how to do it in a couple of weeks. I'm going to start believing in the power of multiplication for my family. I'm going to start working it. I'm going to not just pray over it. I'm going to plan and pray pray at the same time. Most of us are blessed that we're not, even, we're not even half as destitute as this widow woman was. She came to church, all she had was two mites. But she said, I'm going to church with no husband, no insurance policy, neglectful children who aren't here with me, and I'm coming to put God to the test to see if he will make a way for me. And long before the Constitutional Congress ever came together, she was saying, this is all I got in my business. I'm going to mind my own business and I trust in my God. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the intention of President Dwight D. Eisenhower when he changed the Fugio coin slogan, mind your own business, to in God we trust at the bottom of our currency, that your money would actually, everywhere it went, would be saying a prayer. That every time you put money into your pocket, into your Venmo, through Venmo, through PayPal, or from your boss, that company you work for, your money is actually praying. 
It's saying a prayer. And the prayer is everything I need goes through a prayer line. See, this is the moment for those who are delinquent on some bills and you need God to catch you up. You need to start proclaiming what your money is telling you in God. I trust. Hey, I love America. I love America. Yes, we need to get back to trusting God in America. But let me tell you something. If America goes to hell in a handbasket, you can still trust God. Because I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Come on now. She was saying putting two mites in an offering plate. No sound was made. I trust God to supply me with all of my needs. And here's what we, and I trust him to do it. You know why we're crazy? What, look at me. Because we trust the cable company when we pay the bill. We expect ESPN to come on, don't we? When we go to the gas station, we expect gas to fill our tank and not Pepsi-Cola. I want to say something to you. Look at me. Young parents, look up here at me. How can you trust Exxon? How can you trust Charter? How can you trust Xfinity? How can you trust Dish Network? How can you trust Netflix? And yet you don't believe that when you give to God and get yourself in order under His oil and His glory, that everything He told me that could be mine, everything He said He would birth through my life can come to pass when he can trust me with what he's blessed me with. I came to tell some of you who don't have any dreams or any visions or any goals, but I, I can tell some of you don't, but those of you who are believing God for a great impact in your life, this is where you have to get. In fact, I'll read it to you one more time. Luke 21, 3, show them Isaiah. It says, Jesus said, I say to you, this poor woman has put in more than all than these rich people. This means, y'all, look at me. You know what that means? You know what that, God, you know what that's literally saying? It is saying that the Lord Jesus was so deep in her business. They know, listen to this one, the rich people who gave and clanked in the altar so everybody could hear it, shh, shh, they gave out of their surplus. But she gave out of her substance. Jesus is saying, who do you think's better off? I say again, poor people, middle class, lower middle class people, we're the ones feeding the hungry of this world. We're the ones building churches. Hey, vineyard, it's us poor people putting on food drives, feeding the 2,000 cars coming through here. It's us poor people. It's us. It's us. And a few friends, thank God, from Tyson and some other places. But here's what I'm here to tell you. Compared to what those other people gave, her two mites, it didn't pay the mortgage of the church. It didn't meet the payroll. It didn't pay utilities of a church. But when she gave what she had, it put a mandate on the oil on her life. I want somebody to know God says, I'm looking for what you are going through. And I won't let you struggle in this next season like you did if you will get your Monday through your Saturday finances as exciting as you do your Sunday expectation in worship. I'm getting, hey, 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 young college students, teenagers, look up here. If you could get this going right now, you will be a multimillionaire in no time. No time. But you got to get it right now. And I don't have time to give you the numbers on it, but you got to get this right now. And God says, when you start getting it right now, and I start trusting you as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 20-year-old with money, not to go blowing it on your honey, not to do all kinds of stupid stuff, but to, but to have enough for yourself, have enough for God. Pay your God, pay yourself, and live off the rest. We call it a 10, 10, 80 plan. Pay your God 10% of your paycheck. Pay yourself. Invest in a mutual fund. Invest in Vanguard. Roth IRA, do something that pays yourself for the future and then live off the 80%, you'll be a multimillionaire by the time you hit 40 years of age. God says, if I can trust you that much, then guess what? If I can trust you over two mites, I might can trust you over two million. The problem with her is she ran out of time. 
She was a widow. She was older. She'd lost her strength. That's why the Bible says you got to start now. And if you're looking at me today and you have ruined a lot of time in your past, look at me, look at me, look at me. And you don't have the time in front of you, the runway in front of you. God says, don't waste another second. Start it now. Because when you give out of your substance and not your surplus, God says, I'll rearrange all this. I, re- I heard a story recently of a little girl who had, a, uh, who had a, a dying father sick with cancer. And the little girl went to Walmart, and while she was walking through the store, she saw a baby doll that she wanted. And her mama, she told her mama, she said, Mommy, I want that doll. The mama said, We can't get you that doll. Daddy's sick. We have to spend money for daddy's medicines. I want you to have it, but we can't afford it right now. The amazing hand of God healed that little girl's father and he went back to working in his career. At her next birthday, several months later, he got her that baby doll that she wanted. But the Sunday after her birthday, which was her birthday party was on a Saturday morning, balloons and everything, all of a sudden they went to church on Sunday morning and the preacher got up and preached that we have to give God what we love the most in life. The little girl started crying when they passed the offering plate. She took that little baby doll and put it in the offering plate. Some of the ushers started laughing, and then some of them started crying. People started pointing at her, and her mother asked her, why did you just put your baby doll in that offering plate? The little girl said, because I love this doll the most, but I wanted to give it to God, who I really love the most. On Tuesday of that week, that was Sunday morning, the pastor came by the house, and he had... a a doll in a nice gift bag. And the pastor said, I saw you Sunday, looking down at the little girl, said, I saw you Sunday, and I appreciate your sacrifice, but I came to give you your doll back. And the pastor waited for the little girl to say, oh, thank you, preacher, thank you, yes, 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 and run and hug her, but she started crying. The little girl then said, I can't take that from you, pastor. The pastor said, oh, it's okay. You've modeled for us what sacrificial giving looks like. And the little girl starts crying harder. And she says, I still can't take it back. He said, why can't you take it back from me? She said, because I never gave it to you. I didn't give it to you. When you get your stuff right and you get to minding your business, and God gives you the ability to make an impact on somebody else's life, I want all of y'all to understand right now, when you give to this church, if you are a regular attender here and stockholder and you give, you're not giving to this church. You're giving to the God who has been better to you than anything else in this world. You're not paying bills. You're giving to God because the world didn't give it and the world didn't take it away. I want to say this to you, and I'm through preaching. Your next blessing is not, listen listen to me, this is kind of prophetic. Your next blessing is not going to come from the hand of people. Can you imagine finally coming to the day that you don't owe anybody anything? You can't imagine it, can't you? Because you've you've been hacked. This world runs on debt. Not this one. Not this one. And I don't want that for you. God will bless you with what you've got left. You're not in competition with anybody. And I came today to say God is going to bless your business, your family business, your next business, your financial business, your occupation business, everything connected to you. But you have got to take a raw, naked look and say, Honey, if you're married, honey, let's stop the madness. If you're single, can I please stop? No, I'm not being funny to you. Can we please stop this stupid spending with stuff we won't even care about in six months? Well, now, Brady, I'm going to buy it so I can, I can make a profit on it. I'm not talking about something you do like that. I'm talking about expendable. Instead of being producers in the kingdom, we have become American consumers so that if somebody today, if somebody did come, you know what I told God? I said, God, I want to be able to offer enough, I want to have enough money in my life so that the wealthy, when they know me well enough, that they know me to the point that when they see a need, they call me and say, Brady, where can we put this? Because God trusts me. 
But I also want to be able, when I see somebody poor, when I see somebody hurting, if I see somebody I want to send on a mission trip around the world to feed starving people in places that I can't go or are not able to go, I want to be able to say, hey, here you go. I won't even miss it. Wouldn't you love to be there? I feel faith rising in this room. But you got to quit being, forgive me for saying, a belt buckle of the Bible belt, fellowship dinner, chicken fried chicken dinner Christian. You got to become, I need some thinkers in Milan, Tennessee. Come on, help me now. I need some people, look at me, look at me, look at me. I need some people thinking. I need some entrepreneurs. I need some people ready to do something for God. If this church would have had your finances ready, y'all you ta started talking over three years ago about a women's orchard. If we'd have had our personal finances together in this church, by God, we'd already had it fully staffed and running right now. But because we have to pay Kmart before we pay everything else, and we have to pay, we have to say, well, maybe somebody will do it. I want somebody to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to be the one to start it. God, wouldn't that be good? But you got to say, where am I? Last illustration. In the beginning of your Bible, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, look at me, look at me. God came walking through the garden. They had the whole garden. They had the whole garden, y'all. And guess what? Guess what? After they sinned, God said, where are you, Adam? You had the whole garden, now you're hiding. Anybody with me? Today, God's coming through the garden. And he's looking at you, and he's not asking, what have you done? He's asking, where are you? He didn't say, Adam, what have you done? He knew what Adam had done. And guess what? He knows what you've done. He's not asking, what have you done? Shh, shh. He's asking, where are you? How are you in a place where you have now gotten to this age and you said to yourself years ago, you were going to own your own business. You were going to own your house by now. You were going to own vehicles. You were going to have things for you. You were going to have things instead of things having you. But he's saying, where are you? How is it that you gave up on your goals? How is it that you surrendered your dreams? What happened to you? Where are you, Adam, that you settled for a mediocre life? That you have to make up excuses and post selfies that, you, that shows the world you have a great life, but it's a financed life. Where are you? That you feel like you can't move like other people can move because you keep comparing yourself to them. Where are you? Thinking that you're finished because of the mistakes of your past. And now you beg God for handouts after millions have come through your hands. Where are you? That you occupy space and never make a contribution. Where are you? That you have forgotten about the generation that comes after you. That you can give them toys and you can give them trinkets. But if you don't give them a prosperity kingdom mentality, they're going to waste more money than you ever thought about. And you're going to sit in your little guppy house and your little old chair because you can't afford nothing else. And you're going to complain. You just kids spending that money. All they're doing is twice what you did where are you that you're that you said to your wife that if you could ever just find a radical church you would contribute and y'all would get involved and make a difference where are you the sad thing is that Adam when God said Adam where are you watch this y'all Adam never answered the question because I'm looking at some people who have hidden your losses and expenses so much, you don't even know. You, most of y'all in this room and watching me, you have no idea where you even are financially. God says, Adam, because you don't know where you are, watch this. I'm putting you out of the garden. Ooh. Pain for Eve in childbirth. And work from the sweat of your brow till the day you die. But worse, I'm putting you out of my presence. The greatest sin in life, ladies and gentlemen, is having areas of your life outside of the garden, outside of the presence of God. So the question is not, can I please teach a church full of people? 
in the belt buckle of the Southern Bible Belt. It's not about are you in church? Are you in His presence? Is your money in His presence? Is your mind in His presence? Is your boat in His presence? Is your new back porch in His presence? Are your shoes, is your makeup, is all the toys, are all the toys, can you, are you in His presence? Or are you just wanting fire insurance to get out of hell? Can you get yourself back together? I'm not here to judge you. I'm asking you, can you get yourself back together? This little bald guy believes you can. You got it. You know how I know you got it? Because you got this far. What does the Bible say about you? The greatest, listen, the greatest, most valuable thing you have is not the hundred dollars in your pocket or the millions in your bank. It is your soul. Because what does your Bible say? The greatest currency you own is your soul. Currency, currency, current, a river flowing here today, gone tomorrow. That's why Jesus said, I tell you what, when he saw your sin debt, he said, I will go to the earth and I will pay the ransom for your soul. Jesus said, I'll be such a bad to the bone businessman that I'll buy your soul back from the enemy. And once I buy her back, once I buy him back, watch this, then I'm going to get in their business and I'm going to create a life and I'm going to create a destiny and I'm going to get in their family tree and I'm going to destroy poverty in their life. I'm going to destroy everything the enemy has. I don't expect all of you to shout because all y'all are used to is some little three point in a poem kind of stuff. You would pay thousands of dollars to go sit in a seminar to teach you what I just taught you. You got it free on a Sunday. What are you going to do with the free information that God just gave you? Just keep spending? You say, that's none of your business, Brady. Oh, by God, it is. You know why it is? Because if you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, we're in the same family. And when I see you wasting or you see me wasting, guess what? We ought to call each other out. We ought to call each other out. I know who's millionaires in my life. I got friends that are multi-millionaires and I know who are paupers. And you know who supports the cause of Christ more than most of my millionaire friends? It's those paupers who say, Lord, I'm just going to give you what I got because I want to make a difference in this world. And I came today not to preach to the rich folks. I came today to preach to those of you who are the down and outers. Mind your business. Get yourself together. God's not through with you yet. If you're 12 years old and you're mowing yards this summer, you say, well, I got 12 yards. Go get 24. If you've been laid off, go to work wherever you can. Dig a ditch. Do whatever you have to do. Don't let your kids starve. Don't let your kids starve. Get yourself together. Ask yourself a question. Where am I financially? One of the greatest blessings happened to me in this room this morning, and I'm through. Somebody walked up to me and said, hey, I see these dollar signs up here. I just paid so-and-so bill off last payment today. And it was a bad purchase they made, but they stuck with it and they paid it off and they hammered down and they got out of debt. Right now, the average American owes $37,000 on credit card bills. 30% interest, good luck. You know the minimum payment doesn't mean a minimum payment. It takes you 115 years to pay off $34,000 on a minimum $100 a month payment. Really. That's why I say to you, when it comes to your soul, Jesus paid it all. And God can trust you the, the day that He blesses you. And the day that He blesses you is the day He will say to you, can I trust you with this? So in this series, here's what we're going to do. We're fixing to get rolling, y'all. I know most of y'all ain't coming back. That's okay. I don't care. You know why? Because I'm not your mother. 
Your mama already told you what to do and how'd that work out for you? Don't go to church because mama said so. For God's sake, don't go to church because grandmama said so. You come to this church in these next few weeks. I don't care if you never walked in this building. Plug in here for six, four or five weeks. Plug in here for four or five weeks. And let's get your finances ready. If you want to go back to First Presbyterian or somewhere else and you say, I don't like that guy anyway, it's okay. Just come here for a few weeks and let's get your stuff in order and let's get the enemy out of your family tree forever. What am I telling you? Y'all know what I'm telling you is true. What I'm telling you is the day has come. You want to say it with me? Mind your business.